Well, hello everybody and welcome to this session at the Nordic Council of Ministers Pavilion here at COP26. So we're here today to talk about uh, data in the Nordic countries and what we can do bringing data streams together in order to uh, progress our collective ability to, to do important things around climate change, particularly around nature-based solutions, which is the focus of this afternoon's uh, session, this one and the next one. So my name is Richard Sanders and I work at uh, Norse in Bergen as part of a uh, European research infrastructure called ICOS. And the, with me are some colleagues from various parts of the, what we term the blue carbon value chain. And as we go through the session, they'll introduce themselves as they speak. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to uh, introduce the session. The format that we're working to is that we're all going to say a few bits, but really this is about the audience uh, interacting with us, interacting with each other, because our perspective is that to make these nature-based solutions, uh, uh, to unroll them at the speed and scale that it's clear we need, uh, we need to bring together different groups. So I'm a, I work in research infrastructure, there's people from pure science backgrounds, there's people from business backgrounds, we know that in the audience there's people from different backgrounds, and what we're hoping to do is have a discussion about how we together can link together to deliver a value chain that starts with science and ends with influencing policy, ends with delivering something that's useful, not just for people in the Nordics, but people globally. So here we go. So uh, blue carbon, that's the focus of what we're talking about today, the burial of organic matter in the coastal zone. Um, and so this has huge potential, mangroves, salt marshes, uh, seagrass beds, kelp beds, huge potential to uh, address the climate crisis that we face, to um, store more carbon uh, away from the atmosphere. And some countries are viewing this as very, very significant contributions to their NDCs. So um, uh, there's a lot of work to do to understand how this can be maximised, what the risks are, but also what the benefits are. There's really important co-benefits around this, around recreation, fisheries. And the exam question that we're talking about today is what do we need to do to deploy them at scale and at speed? So on the right-hand side, there's just a nice image of uh, the global carbon cycle. And at the bottom, the big blue arrow is the burial of carbon. Here we are. So uh, I think I've kind of made the, the point uh, really uh, clear, I hope. Um, we view blue carbon as not just a science problem. You can go to lots of uh, talks here around how blue carbon works, what it is, what animals, what organisms. But it's not just a science problem. We can do great science on it, but how do we transfer that through? Uh, ultimately to end users, but via this value chain of private sector and large scale investors. Uh, investors. Um, and our perspective again is that Nordic countries have world leading expertise that can build these value chains. So there's just one image of uh, the region between Norway, Sweden and Denmark. Um, there's about eight or 10 million people live in that, in that region. Lots and lots of people, um, lots of users of the marine space, so defense, uh, wind farms, recreation, fishing. All this has to coexist somehow. How do we manage this? What do we do? And we believe that the skills that we learn in the Nordic countries will be useful internationally as well as domestically. So how do we make this happen? Um, that's the question. So with me are three people who are going to tell us how they're going to make it happen together and then we're going to have a discussion. But just before we go there, we're just going to go to the Atlantic Ocean because ultimately this is all around people. Okay? So, um, and it's actually, it's around young people. It's not around us because, you know, we've kind of, we, you know, the actions that we take will set things up for our children, our grandchildren, the children of our friends, and some of them have been on a ship and are going to tell us something about what the ocean means to them and how they're, what they're hoping we can do here in Glasgow this week. So can we have the video please? On August 20th, we set out on the 20 month long One Ocean Expedition. One, two, three. One, two, three. The ship is manned by a small crew, fellow sailors of all ages, scientists and students. The ship is equipped as a research vessel and will collect data throughout the journey. It will serve as a floating university, bringing students, scientists and professionals together. 
The goal is to create attention and share knowledge about the ocean for a sustainable future. So I've been sailing um, ever since the early 70s on sailing ships, uh, cross-Atlantic voyages and uh, voyages over big areas of the world. And during this time, uh, I've seen big changes in relation to especially uh, the garbage that we see floating on the surface, the wind patterns that are changing. We also notice that sea life is a lot less, the last 20 years especially. Catching fish is, is very difficult. On this voyage uh, of more than 30 days, we've only caught three fish so far. So we see a lot of garbage um, on a daily basis, and we, we actually log whatever we see now these days. Det bara har gått en dag med vakte och det är allerede en sida fyllt upp i boka med söppel från i havet. Det är plast, plastposa. Det är nog mest av det som har blivit loggfört. Jag blir lite chockad egentligen. det är ju mitt ut på havet och så allikevel så är det plast som vi ser hela tiden. Det är trist. So seeing all of this, the garbage around us, the, the wind pattern change and temperature changes and um, the diminishing fish and, and sea life resources, we're definitely worried because this uh, cannot continue the way it's going. Here! 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 You heard our captain. He's worried. This is urgent. We need good solutions for the oceans and our climate and we need the world's top leaders to stand together for a sustainable future. So thanks very much for the video. Um, if we go back to the slides, that would be great. Um, so that's the challenge that we face. You heard it from the sea. You know, we're here to provide solutions, and we're going to have a discussion now about how to do that. And so I'm going to hand over to Kiki, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the ship and something about her perspectives on how academia and science can contribute to this, this uh, endeavour. Thanks a lot, Richard, and uh, thanks, uh, Greg, for, for being here. So I'm Kiki Kleiben. I'm the director of the Björken Center for Climate Research at the University of Bergen. And I have a lot of uh, students that are on board this ship. And um, this ship is, uh, is not only more monitoring ocean plastic and checking out the fisheries, because as you saw in a little glimpse in the film, the, in the bowels of the ship, we have mounted very, very advanced uh, instruments, similar instruments that are mounted on on research vessels and cargo vessels all over the ship, all over the world, that are, that are monitoring and collecting really, really important data. So this is a huge get together of, of endeavors of like ships of opportunity that scientists are using to get important data on ocean acidification, CO2 in the ocean. And so this is just one example of, of the way we can, we can collect data. And, um, you're going to talk a little bit more about some of the projects also later, my colleague here, Dorothy. So this, this picture here is showing the carbo cycle, this figure, uh, which is demonstrating basically how we tap into the geological carbon reservoirs that were formed millions and millions of years ago. And we're extracting fossil fuels where that lead to the anthropogenic carbon emissions to the atmosphere that are measuring today. And from, the, uh, from our emissions to the atmosphere, about 25% has been taken up by the ocean and 25% is being taken off, kind of roughly 50% by, by the land and, and ocean sink. And in a very long scenario, over 100,000 years, this is gonna find its way back into the geological reservoir again. But as of now, it's leading to, to global warming. And we expect that these sinks will become less effective under climate change. So all our focus on keeping healthy ecosystems on land and in the ocean as really, really important climate mitigators is what we are talking about here. And let's see, what is happening here? You have to point out the... Oh yeah, there we go, there we are. So, so this figure, uh, so once a year, the researchers, they provide us with a careful accounting of, of basically how much we humans have disturbed the natural carbon cycle. 
the Global Carbon Project was released last night and there's been session about it in the COP meeting already. And the latest numbers um, are really showing a, this really careful accounting as uh, a huge collection of data that has been going on, showing us that that we have that we do understand a lot of the major components and processes within the global carbon cycle, but there are still more to understand. We have to do more research. And it also showing us that we actually, through our actions and through basically whether we're gonna have value chains and basically what are we what are we gonna do to preserve our natural habitats on the planet, it's gonna really help on this uh, these records. There we are. Oh wait. I was going to say a little bit more. <laughs> and uh, so you can say that the, the, the annual budget that comes out provides a very, very valuable resource uh, to, to provide us also to make better climate policy. That's important. And um, it gives us trends, but also quantitative updates and gives us an idea of what we can contribute to in order to stabilize uh, the targets for climate mitigations. And um, if we look at the figure to the right there, uh, that's from last year's carbon report. It, of course, was updated last night with the numbers, but it's showing the cumulative contributions to the global carbon budget from 1850. So basically, we came out of the ice age and we had 10,000 years through the, the present interglacial period where CO2 levels was, was hoovering around sort of 286 ppm. And then we fired up the coal, we started extracting uh, oil, we started extracting gas, and then we can see the levels, how they accumulate, you know, that, that we added 99 ppm of coal, 70 ppm, ppm of oil, 33 ppm from gas and 5 ppm from cement and 98 ppm from land use. It's already there. We're using land and we're, we're, we're actually making sure that more CO2 is coming into the atmosphere. Again, you know, there's a carbon imbalance there is also. 9 ppm represents kind of in a gap that in our current understanding of sources and sinks. And if we look to the right of the figure, the land and ocean sink, which has taken up 9 ppm and 76 ppm recently, which then leaves us with the numbers that we have in the atmosphere today. So especially on the right-hand side of that figure that, that we're going to talk about that we can contribute to. So with that, I'm going to give it over to, uh, to Dorothy that can tell us a little bit more about that kind of huge data collections that goes in. Um. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dorothy Bakker, and I work at the University of East Anglia in the UK. I'm also the chair of SOCAT, the Service Ocean CO2 Atlas. And here today, I'd like to talk a little bit about the measurements of carbon in the oceans that we are making. So these are both measurements in the surface ocean, but also measurements between the surface ocean and the sea floor, so all of the water column. So we make these measurements on a variety of ships, uh, traditionally, we make them on research ships, but we also make them on commercial ships. Uh, the photos show uh, container ships. They also show a cruise ship. We make the measurements on moorings, and quite recently, we started making them on sailing yachts and on autonomous service vehicles. Now, for the surface ocean, when we make measurements, we generally pump the surface water close to our instrument and then make the measurements. But when we take measurements from the water column, we first have to sample the water. And for that, we use a water sampler. And you can see an image of that in the figure on the bottom right. And then once this water sampler is back on deck, full of water, we very carefully take samples uh, from this water sample. And we then analyze these samples in a laboratory for carbon variables. And we can do this either on board, as the examples uh, show you here, or we can take the samples back to land and do the analysis there. And then we uh, put these measurements together, uh, we carry out additional quality control, and we then make these measurements uh, public. And the figure on the bottom right shows that all of this involves a lot of colleagues around the world. Um, and this is very much a collective effort by our community. Um, so we have two uh, synthesis products. One is for the service ocean. That's the service ocean CO2 atlas. 
the figure on the uh, top right shows you the data that we have in there. It shows you all the data that we have, covering quite a large period. Uh, so it looks like we have a lot of data, but if you look carefully at this figure, you see that there are large parts of the ocean where we have few data or possibly no data at all. So despite our best efforts by the international scientific community, there are still large parts of the ocean where we have no data at all. Then we also put the data from the interior ocean together, and we do that in uh, GLODAP, the Global Data Analysis Product. And uh, these measurements are shown in the figure on the bottom right. Uh, you can see that uh, many of these measurements are made along lines which run either east-west or north-south. And uh, we have uh, fewer of these measurements because it takes a lot of effort to collect these samples and to make the measurements. So as the previous speaker uh, said, uh, why do we make these measurements? Well, we make them because they help us to quantify the uptake of carbon dioxide by the oceans. And this is important because the oceans take up 25% of the emissions by human activity. Um, so we need these measurements to make this uh, estimate, but also to study the variation in this uptake. I mean, this uptake can vary uh, by maybe up to 10% between different years and decades. And also we want to, we don't really know how this uptake is going to change when we will reduce our emissions as we are moving to net zero. Also, uh, when we are discussing nature-based solutions in the oceans, we need to continue making these measurements so we can quantify the effectiveness of these nature-based solutions and of naturally, uh, nationally defined contributions in the oceans. I also wanted to uh, emphasize, however, that these measurements are kind of fragile. Many of them are made on short-term research funding and we cannot take these measurements for granted. So we need to have a long-term commitment from governments to, so that we can continue make these measurements and continue the synthesis of these measurements. But also we'd quite like to uh, have uh, more cross-sectorial uh, partnerships uh, and an example of these uh, partnerships is already where we make the measurements on the ships, on the commercial ships, but there can be a lot more uh, work like this. And this is where I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Dorothy. And my pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is uh, Luvisa Bergman, and I'm a manager at Accenture Development Partnerships a unit part of the global consultancy firm Accenture that's focused on international development. And I'm co-leading our efforts in uh, climate mitigation, particularly focused on the blue economy. And I'm here today to emphasize the instrumental role that the private sector plays in achieving a sustainable blue economy, and therefore also restore the blue carbon sinks. Because we are currently today in the middle of a transformational shift. A transformational shift in how we, as individuals, but also organizations, are viewing the world's ocean. And so, uh, I will stop by sharing a uh, personal reflection that I've had during the last 18 months when working from my home office in Stockholm. So I have at several occasions been having a stressed feeling and uh, after spending hours in front of the screen with no social interaction, I've been having a longing after looking towards the blue magnificent ocean. And I think that's partly because I used to spend my summers along the east coast of Sweden and there I got a chance to encounter the blue forest that the Baltic Sea is offering. So I used to swim around in kelp forest, play around with my friends in eelgrass meadows. And all this, of course, supports the fact that I today have a strong relationship to the world's ocean. And so the last 18 months working from home, I have actually been able to overlook the blue ocean. And it's not because I have a uh, terrific sea view from my apartment in Stockholm, but rather because I do have this. I, got ha I have a smartphone. And in this smartphone, I have an app called Google Earth. And what Google Earth have 
enable us to do today is that we can go and swim with bottlenose dolphins in the Myrmidon Reef, and then the moment after we can explore the coral reef structures in the Noma Reef, or go out and investigate the cod populations in Horseshoe Bay. All this is now possible from our couch. And so what Google Earth have done is that they have been initiating a transformational shift in how we are viewing the world's ocean. And they've done so by democratizing data, because this data existed before as well. So today, we can sit in our homes and we can explore and discover the world's ocean thanks to free, open, and universal data. And so what Google Earth have been able to do is to leverage a exponential technology and by doing so also enable this data for citizens and organization. Before, we have been very much relying on uh, satellite images and uh, GIS experts that have been analyzing this data. And very seldom it's been available to the open public. But now, finally, oceans have started to get a face in the public discussions. And so this is just one example of how private organizations can play a crucial role in creating the enabling conditions that are needed to improve conservation efforts. The private sector sits on the innovative power that's needed to develop the technologies and the data. And they sit on the financing power needed to scale these solutions. And last, but definitely not least, they are the ones that often need to bring ambition into action. Because this is where some of the practices might not follow the standards that are needed for proper conservation efforts. So we are seeing this first transformational shift happening. But at the same time, we have only mapped one fifth of the world's ocean. And we heard from Dorothy also when it comes to carbon sinks. And uh, we are here today in Glasgow, and we're hearing the world leaders negotiating about introducing 10% marine protected areas. But the reality is that global warming is happening at 100% of the coastlines. And they're happening at a tremendous speed, scale, and depth that's unforeseeable for anyone. So that's why we believe that we need a one ocean, a one approach. We need to take a holistic perspective on the ocean. And we need to identify the competences and the resources needed to achieve that. So we at Accenture are strongly encouraging this type of cross-sectoral partnership. We work with civil society. For example, World Wildlife Fund that we have as neighbors here today in the Panda Hub, Science-Based Target Network, to understand the planetary boundaries and the thresholds and the limits that we need to operate within. We're working with uh, governments and public sector, and most importantly, private sector, in order to bring ambition into action. And let me just give you one example when we have been deploying this framework. So our world coral reefs are currently in a tremendously bad state, and it's estimated that 90% will be extinct year 2050. So we came together with AIMS, the Australian Institute for Marine Science, and started to reimagine the way that we are currently monitoring coral reefs. And it all started in Dublin at one of Accenture's innovation centers, and we quickly agree that one of the issues is the uh, lack of access to coherent, reliable, and comparable data. So as of today, we have reimagined a solution that's using artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and big data analytics. And it's built on Amazon Web Services. And this platform is allowing marine scientists to directly upload images of coral reefs, and it's automatically deciding the state of its health. So this is just one out of many solutions where technology plays a really, really important role in improving conservation efforts and to inform policymakers, but also businesses. And 
this type of solution can of course be deployed to many of the use cases that we have in the Nordic region as well. To map out carbon sinks, to understand the health of our blue forests. So that's also why we're here today, to continue to have a discussion together with you on how we can collaborate in a Nordic blue carbon value chain. With that said, I will hand over to you, Richard, to take us through the Q&A session that we have in front of us. Well, uh, thanks, Lavisa, and thanks, Dorothy, and thanks, Kiki. Um, I really enjoyed those talks. Um, I hope you did too uh, on YouTube, and I hope you did in the audience as well. So. Um, Right now, I think we've probably got about half an hour left. We'd like to just have a conversation with you, with anybody on YouTube that wants to send us a question. Um, and really, the thing that we'd like to focus on is we've got scientists here, we've got academics, we've got uh, people operating um, large-scale infrastructures, we've got people from the private sector, we've got an audience to do all sorts of things. What should we do collectively to take this forward? What's the big challenges? From your perspective, what's the thing we ought to do next? Nick, what's your perspective? Uh, Do you want to introduce much. yourself, Nick? Yeah, definitely. Um, my name's Nick Craig. I'm from the Green Digital Finance Alliance, um, and uh, I run a project on uh, basically linking ocean data to finance. Um, and yeah, perhaps that's a that's a nice place to start. Would be to to get the panel's perspectives on how you can get these different data streams to to connect better together. It's there's no question that the data exists. But how, for example, um, Dorothy and Louisa, do you see actually these data sets being able to be utilized more uh, in each other's world? So um, uh, thanks for that, Nick. I think that's a great question. Um, we've seen lots of, uh, lots of talks at this meeting where people have been talking about how do scientists get their data to policymakers more effectively so they can use it to make decisions about the real world. Um, Louisa, what's your perspective? What do we do wrong so that you don't have the data you need? Yeah, we can start by sharing some reflections of, yeah, just like you said, what has actually been going wrong. Uh, if we look back historically, I mean, this data has existed, right? But it has seldom been shared with the ones that actually need to act on it or implement on it. So what we need to do jointly is to really come together and start to create that aggregator so that we can combine the data sets, but also inform implementers about how to act on them. So what does it actually mean to not destroy the blue carbon sinks that we have in the Nordic region? We need to translate that to the ocean-based industries, may it be aquaculture, commercial fisheries, tourism, shipping, because it all means different things. How can we inform the shipping lines to take different routes or avoid introducing aquaculture in marine protected areas or potentially areas that will be MPAs in the future? So that's why, uh, I mean, the type of consortium that we are, are looking to engage in here becomes very, very important. So uh, that there is this holistic value chain. And Dorothy, do you, do you see your data being um, taken up and used by the private sector in the way that Lavisa uh, describes could happen? Uh, well, the private sector is very welcome to use our data. Uh, because we are making the these data products are public um, and you can find the data products by if you go to our website you can you can find the data products uh, I should say the photograph here on the bottom uh, right actually shows a, a planning workshop by some scientists involved uh, in the in the period that we are we're creating SOCAT so these data products are being used um, and one of the um, uh, high level, uh, high impact uh, studies that is using the SOCAT data set is the global carbon uh, budget that Kiki talked about uh, earlier, uh, it's on the previous slide, uh, and that was released this morning um, in the science pavilion, uh, two pavilions down. Um, now the private sector is also very welcome to use our data. And we are talking very actively about how we can integrate or, uh, the, the different data products, how we can make it easier for users to not just use, say, data that are in SOCAT, but also to use data that are in GLODAP. And those are very active discussions that are going on uh, in our community at the moment, partly for Sustainable Development Goal 14.3.1, uh, uh, which is ocean acidification. So, Kiki, um, yeah, so that, thanks, Dorothy, for, for that answer. So we've got two different worlds here, Kiki. How are we going to bring them together? Well, that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, I think, yeah, first, I just wanted to say something a little bit, add a little bit, but in terms of data collection, 
because there are some, some international efforts that are st establishing a whole new level of data collection. I mean, one of them is the Arctic Synoptic Survey, uh, where Arctic nations that are not known for sharing data um, uh, now really come together with, the, with agreeing on common data platforms and common ways of measuring and gathering data. And yeah, so you're doing that already in SOCAT, but you know, earlier today there was a session here about acidification in the Atlantic Ocean, the Baltic, and the Arctic. And Arctic you know, is one of the hardest areas to reach. Uh, and the fact that the Arctic nations have come together and agreed to have this form of data collections uh, is really unique. And I think that's going to be really important for policymakers too. These are incredibly immense important areas, as important ecosystem in the Arctic. But bringing, bringing it together, I, you know, starting with, with the fact that we have joint sessions, it, it is a long way to go because we are really in our, in our silos. We are providing data. We are doing our, our best to make sure that the data are more transparent, more open, because uh, they're government funded data. So ultimately, that's where we are. But the step to, to work with policymakers, to work with companies, uh, to be part of a value chain, that's like a, a real foreign thing for a lot of scientists, we have to say. So, so I think there's a, there's a knowledge gap there that we have to cover and, and somehow try to sort of meet each other's worlds and, and, and see, okay, what is it that businesses need? What is it that governments need? What is it that local regions need of knowledge? And I think we have a lot to, to build on from the Nordic perspective because there are some good collaborative examples that we can tap into that would really you know, inform us and make us stronger in terms of building these kind of really important partnerships to, to help you know, combat and might mitigate the emissions. So that's a great answer. And I mean, one thing that maybe we should do at the end is say one thing that we're all going to take away and do personally to kind of bring us together um, from whatever part of the system we're in. So Rick, over to you. So, um, so there's tremendous public interest in this problem. But uh, the, the data that Dorothy, for example, has shown is very carefully collected by uh, you know, scientific cruises or dedicated work with ferries. Is there a way of um, tapping into that huge public interest to try and massively expand the data collection? Um, trying to get charities or groups of people to fund floats or different observing systems to try and expand this data set. So there's a bit more people ownership and engagement in the data that's needed to answer these questions. Because your, your maps, Dorothy, highlight the scale of the problem and the large parts of the ocean where we just don't have the routine sampling. So Thanks, Rick, and, and I should just say that's Rick Williams from the University of Liverpool, who's um, uh, made some really important contributions to our understanding of the global carbon cycle. So thanks for coming to our session. Um, so who wants to pick up this one? Uh, what is the role of citizen science in, in, in coastal, coastal observing, and how can that play into this solutions in the coastal zone debate? Anybody in the audience? Who's going to volunteer to, to take sensors on their next holiday to the beach? I just want to say shortly that uh, even though it's not coastal, I mean, this tall ship that's circumventing the, the, the globe node is a great example where, you know, we went out and begged for money to install these PCO2 instruments in the ship, right? And we're going to the southern Indian Ocean and the, and the South Pacific where, where few people go and few ships go. So we're collect collecting really important data. But if you think about the, the enormous global effort that's gone into the, the, the measuring CO2 in the atmosphere, I mean, even little Norway's got a measuring station up in Svalbard doing this. We don't have this global network. This should be a real sort of global ownership to build up these kind of networks and, and steadfast monitor the ocean. We're, we're not doing that. We're saying that we're going to live off the ocean, we're going to tap into the ocean, we're going to get more resources from the ocean, but we are not caring about the ocean by looking after it and, and monitoring it. I think engaging and get empowerment of, of, of coastal um, population and people is really important in this. So to know your local ocean, that literacy is incredibly important. But are we going to get our research councils to, to fund it? Are we going to get our governments to fund it? Or do we need to go to other groups like, like fisheries or aquaculture to, to beg for money to, to get this done? Because it has to be done. And it's a real challenge. Okay. 
Thanks, Kiki. I mean, it's great to hear somebody that's got, gone to a private sector corporation and got them to fund an observing system in remote parts of the global ocean. Congratulations. Um, but, Lavisa, how, do you see a role for citizen science in this space? Uh, individuals contributing their, from their own efforts to a bigger picture? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we are all uh, data aggregators. So when it comes to creating that data pool, definitely. And I think uh, working with the communities and the crowd mechanism is definitely a, a potential avenue. Uh, but also like what we heard here earlier around, you know, involving the NGOs or INGOs or charities. I know, for example, the World Wildlife Fund just now ahead of COP have been launching a value at risk assessment framework that aims to particularly focus on, on private sector uh, organizations in order to then, of course, take a risk perspective of understanding what are the impacts of some of the nature-based solutions in the oceans, uh, but then also identify opportunities. And then we start to think more about you know, the financing because it's not until now that this really starts to be a topic for some of the ocean-based industries and then willingness to actually invest in, in nature-based solutions. Great, so I'm really glad you mentioned finance because we want to make sure we talk about that because nothing happens if there isn't a financial incentive to do it. Um, but just very quickly before we go there, Dorothy, um, I know you're interested in new technology. Do you think you can make something that looks a bit like a COVID test to measure, to measure ocean acidification? We've got a whole generation of people now that can do analytical chemistry in their bedrooms. <laughs> um, can we do that? Can we do ocean acidification in the same way? Oh, that'd be... That'd be kind of amazing if we could. I, I, I guess basically it, someone will have to come up with, you know, a, a really rather simple pH test that is also useful, uh, accurate enough to be useful. I guess when we nowadays do a COVID test or, you know, there's the, there's the simple test and then in the bedroom and then there's the more complicated one where it's done in the laboratory. So if we could come up with simple measurements that could provide you know, very large coverage, very large spatial and temporal coverage. That'd be kind of very useful. I have been wondering in the past, uh, which is a slightly different topic, on whether citizens could maybe uh, contribute to our quality control. Uh, whether we could crowd outsource some of the quality control that we do. Um, and I've also wondered if we can make our data products more accessible by maybe having some kind of game that uh, people could play with our data set. But uh, this hasn't Gone. The ideas are very welcome. Okay. Verna, over to you. So this is Verna Kutch, who's the, um, the director, director General of ICOS, uh, which is a European research infrastructure. Verna, give us your yes, perspective. I'm a a co-host, yes. Um, my, my question, my, my spontaneous question was now, how do you get the citizens into the middle of the Southern Pacific? <laughs> um, I think that's the problem. and. Uh, that's also the, the threshold of, of citizen science in, in, in this one. But I wanted to, to give another aspect. Um, we learned that uh, I think it's more than 20%, 25% of the, of the emissions uh, are taken up by the ocean. So that's a, a huge natural service that we are more or less getting for free. And um, if we put a price on this, on this uh, CO2 uptake by the ocean, it would be billions. And for me, it's really sometimes a disgrace that we have to go while, while the ocean is giving a billion dollar natural service to all of us, we have to go and really beg for the, for the um, money for some ships to, to measure this, this uh, big sink. And um, <clears throat> I think that's a, something that uh, um, our governments, but also public uh, uh, industry and, and, and many other organizations should really see that uh, we, we, we need to observe this thing, we need to quantify this thing, and uh, it's a billion, billion dollar thing yeah. if you put a price on it. That, so that's a really important point. There was a suggestion that the solution to this is a, it's a, it's a million dollar solution to a billion dollar problem and, and so therefore a really good investment. Um, but whilst we're talking about money, let's talk about how we incentivize people to, um, to, 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 to enhance the natural sink. Um, I mean, nobody's going to, you know, at the end of the day, if people are going to maintain or steward or enhance blue carbon reservoirs in the coastal zone, um, they have to be, uh, there has to be a business model that stacks up. So we know how to do this, 
but how do we pay for it? So I can see somebody nodding in the audience. Uh, do you have a perspective on what's the financial mechanism that we need to put in place to make this happen? Um, I'm not sure that any of us are experts here except perhaps Lavisa. Um, how are we going to do this together? Lots of blank faces. So um, I think that really goes to the heart of the problem. Um, if, we want to, if we want to have this new nascent industry that's got to be deployed rapidly and at scale, then uh, somehow we have to pay for it. So um, Nick, I'm going to go to you again. You're the closest we've got to, uh, to somebody that's expert in this. You, 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 you work a lot in this space. What's the big problem here? Yeah. Um, gosh, that's loud. Uh, <laughs> I think that what uh, I see with a lot of the investors we work with who are big kind of institutional level investors, asset owners sort of level, they, there is increasing demand for uh, looking at business models that are ocean positive. But what those uh, investors find difficult is actually firstly defining what ocean positive is within a business model and then getting the data to link to understanding, okay, well, if I've invested in this company or this solution, um, what is the what are the key metrics that I need to to be able to then log? You know, with climate, it's much simpler in that there's a very simple carbon, uh, you know, carbon metric that you can follow for a company. But when we talk about the oceans, it's far more complex, and that there are many more metrics uh, to be considered. Um, especially around biodiversity and things like that. So I think that that's the kind of crux of the issue is, as I see it, is, is defining ocean positivity uh, in, a, in a kind of product or solution and a company, um, and then getting the metrics uh, narrowed down enough that can be understandable from an investor's point of view. So that's a really interesting perspective. Do you see merit in, um, so how, how, do we, how do we put this together? Um, because what you described sounds to me very much like scientists talking directly to business. Is there actually enough of a crossover between them for that to work, or do we need some interpretation in the middle somewhere? Yeah, I don't know. I think, Dorothy, you hit on it earlier in that you, you said all of your data is available, public, anyone can use it. The problem is that uh, investors don't have the capacity to go in and, and dig into those very quite niche uh, data sets, uh, especially when it's geolocated, and then you have a lot of um, yeah, capacity and skills issues within those institutions to, to be able to decode that. And that might be one of 50 things uh, within an ESG team and investors uh, that they have to consider. So yeah, I think there is a need for a kind of interlocutor uh, role um, within that, yeah. So, so that's a, a really nice, um, a nice new niche for, for somebody to step into, perhaps, um, because we don't have anybody who's kind of like speaking to both these communities on the panel. Um, so, so it would be great to, to, to think that maybe as a result of this panel, um, we can kind of like move forward together into that space. So, um, Lavisa, you've worked a lot with scientists, you've worked a lot with businesses. Do they talk together well? Well, we're... <laughs> I'd like to see the ways that could be improved, right? And I mean, for sure, uh, I think it's important for all of us and maybe even more for us as consultants to work as that catalyst to bridge uh, the communication. Um, and uh, I th think now, particularly what you mentioned relates to the finance community and uh, also measuring value in terms of conservation efforts, which is of course uh, tricky. But we have a, a number of really good and strong examples of when that has been enabled. Um, I'm thinking, of course, like now that ESG is taking more of a focus on blue bonds and, and, and blue obligations. Um, we have the Nordic Investment Bank, for example, that have been setting up the blue bond since a couple of years ago. And we have several different alternative mechanisms of uh, both blend and finance, but then also um, the whole mechanism around carbon trade that can restore natural carbon sinks. There are several projects in Southeast Asia that has been focused on restoring mangrove forests. And that can directly pay back in terms of conservation efforts on you know, protection of the local communities, financial income, uh, food security as well. And so actually turn it into financial value. So I think uh, those are the type of use cases we need to find um, in order to 
translate, you know, what does this mean for an investor versus uh, yeah, the scientific outcomes that we are desiring. So you said something really important there. You, you spoke about blended finance. Now, um, I'm not completely familiar with that, um, and I'm sure uh, some people out there on YouTube and maybe in the audience are there either. What do you, can you just unpack what, what you view blended finance as being? So blended finance, when you use the mechanism from both public private sector to come together and support a initiative. Uh, so that's, and it can be, you know, uh, in terms of setting up a bond or impact investing, um, as well as ecosystem-based financial mechanism. So some of the more innovative uh, financing approaches that we start to see occurring now in the ecosystem. And is that really taking off now? We can see new things happening that wouldn't have happened without this way of financially managing things? Yeah, I would say it's definitely a, uh, an enabler to tap into some of these more explorative projects that we haven't seen the finance community involved in before. Okay, well that's really, good. that's really good to hear. And Kiki, I'm wondering, you have, in, you have lots of interactions with students. Mm. Are, you, are, you, are you raising students or producing students that can kind of speak both to language, uh, both to science and to business and entering this, this, this world that certainly I'm slightly scared of and unfamiliar with? Well, definitely uh, the, the, the new students that, 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 that we are producing, if we can say that, uh, they are they have a much broader context than what you and I ever had, Richard. Oh, I mean, thanks. In terms of really, really, you know, tapping into the full understanding that you know, you know, we're just going to work with one SDG. Climate is my only thing. They're actually really looking at the synergies. We see a lot of the new education that is coming actually is looking at the the synergies from, from, uh, you know, the, the broadness of their education, tapping into both economy, technology, and natural sciences and humanities. So it's it's it's, it's a much broader education, not all, but some students are coming out which are really uniquely targeted for this. But I just wanted to say something that, you know, we talked about empowerment and also that understanding, so sort of bridging economy and, and science is important, but then back again to how do we get citizens involvement. I think this whole, this whole understanding that you know, to, to work with uh, the blue carbon and, and think about it as an economy, but as a preservation also, and, and this is really important for, for, for climate, for our planet. It has to do with our well-being. It has to do with our culture and heritage. And yeah, it might also have to do with our economy. But there's, there's a lot of avenues where we can get people engaged. It's not all about money. It's also that we, we are actually coastal nations, the Nordic countries. So, so there's a lot of things in common. I mean, I recognize myself in your kelp forests. And it, it is, you know, our kelp forests is our coastal peatlands and it's our, I'm a lover of the soft benthic habitats. That's my coast. So, so we're different, but th there are some really important synergies that I think that we can tap into. And we're sitting in this pavilion now where, you know, the, the voice should go out to those who are sitting on research money and sitting on networks to, to really come together and say, could we, could we get the synergies? Can we get money to get important data? Can we get money to translate our sciences so that it's useful for, for business partners as well? So there's a, there's a long value chain to build. Yeah, so on that note, I don't know how much time we've got left. I'll just have a, uh, we've got 12 minutes left. So um, I said at the beginning, Dorothy, you've got. Well, Yes, I, I wanted to add that I think we shouldn't just look at the ocean in isolation. We should also look at the ocean and the connections between land and rivers and estuaries and coastal seas and the ocean. Uh, what we do on land also affects the ocean. Uh, for example, when there is a lot of soil erosion, organic carbon gets into rivers and some of that will be outgassing awesome. in, uh, from the rivers and some of it will be outgassing in estuaries and coastal seas. So uh, we can do things on land that will actually increase the ocean carbon sink. Um, and also, I mean, the same if you talk about uh, mangroves and other things uh, in the coastal seas, what we do on land or on the land ocean boundary may impact on the ocean. And I think we shouldn't forget that. And that's, I think a very important management tool is actually what we do on land. And many of these things where we can act on land um, they're good for the ocean if we reduce, for example, soil erosion. But first of all, they're also very good for soils if we reduce soil erosion. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So lots and lots of co-benefits there. Right. Emmanuel tells me that we have a question from the floor, um, which he's going to read out from the chat. From the chat. Yes. Um, 
Carl Jonsson is asking, do current small to medium scale businesses really see themselves winning in being ocean positive? Or is it something that feels artificial to them? So that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to speak to it. Does anybody in the audience represent an, an SME who could kind of maybe give a perspective from, from that, businesses of that scale? What's that? No, so I guess that kind of illustrates a gap in the, in the, in the composition of our panel. Um, I'd like to think that, uh, that, that, um, that, that, that the small businesses can kind of um, can use the skills that we collectively have. Um, um, and we, I was about to ask the panel uh, what their takeaway from this is and what the action they're going to take forwards is. And I guess that's triggered a, a memo for me which is to really reach out much more strongly to businesses of that scale within, um, within the, the fantastic outreach capacity that, uh, that, that exists in Bergen to really work out how we can um, uh, support them in their ambitions um, to, to run their businesses in a climate neutral way, which ultimately is what we all want to do. Um, so that's my perspective on what I'm planning to take forward. Uh, I'm going to ask the rest of the panel if they've got something that they're going to do as a result of this. And then anybody else in the audience that's been inspired by our discussion that's going to do something different, uh, maybe you could share that with us as well. So, Lavisa, what are you going to do differently now that we've all sat here for an hour? I would like to continue this discussion together with you and potentially you here in the audience to uh, identify concrete opportunities on how we can collaborate to create the Nordic region a more blue region, so to say because I think we have uh, the Nordic Council as a, a body, a very strong body that provides the kind of means and the research and, and the network that's needed to really make, region, make the Nordic region a leader in this area. Okay, and Dorothy, what will, you, what will you do differently? I'm not sure what I will do differently, but I wanted to make the point that we already have some collaborations with, uh, or my colleagues around the world have collaborations with businesses, for example, some of these CO2 systems are on ferries um, or, and, and also there's a picture of a cruise ship there and there are some uh, CO2 systems on container ships. Now, some of these uh, companies are actually, especially if they've got a ferry, they've got people on board, they might be showing the measurements in real time uh, to their, uh, the people that they have on board that might be making the ferry crossing. But I'm also aware that some of these container ships, they're actually not asking any credit for the fact that they host the CO2 system. And maybe these businesses might want to consider that in the future if they'd like to, um, in a way, make more use of these measurements and make it part of their business model in, in showing their uh, uh, contribution to studying climate. Okay, so trying to somehow uh, incentivize more strongly uh, collection of data by, by non-academic players, but interested people. Yeah, uh, yeah that's uh, something that I've spent a lot of time trying to work out how to do. Um, if you've got solutions to it, then that's great. Um, and Kiki, what, what will you do differently? First of all, I thought that was an excellent choice to sort of, you know, make sure that the companies that get the machines feel that they're doing good things. Yeah. Uh, I think I want to make what, what Dorothy said a little bit earlier, uh, my words too, that high quality data is not something we should be taking for granted. And to be able to monitor uh, the data, uh, monitor uh, CO2 and ocean parameters is vital for our knowledge. Uh, not just for us, but for future generations and for the policymakers. But I also want to emphasize that it's not just about measuring. We also have to go in and see the areas and regions where we can contribute to restoration and maybe even to grow, you know, to grow back uh, some of the lost sinks. We need them also in the ocean. Yeah, so that's... Um... Oh. So we have a contribution from the floor who's going to tell us what your takeaway is? No, not really, but my name is Solun Figenskaushelum. I'm from the Norwegian Institute of Water Research. I just wanted to let you know that the National Ocean Platform under the United Nations Global Compact in Norway is zooming in on precisely this going forward. So NEVA is part of that ocean platform and they're starting up work now in blue finance and blue taxonomy and they're also looking into nature-based solutions for industries. And th they're looking for precisely what you're talking about, bankable projects. 
how can you do this in a good way and do something good for nature and make money at the same time. And finally, uh, the last topic they're looking into is uh, science-based targets for industries. So this is really, I think, something that's going to be moving forward. And um, all the data you've talked about are so important, so keep it up. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. That's uh, uh, really encouraging to know. Um, so maybe we can have a conversation later about how to kind of like start putting all this together, um, building on the conversation we've had today. Um, I'm looking at the audience now. Okay. Maybe just add, uh, very happy to continue speaking about afterwards. Uh, we've been working a lot with you and Global Compact as uh, one of our Accenture partners and also the Ocean Hub at the Science Based Target Network. So thanks for raising that. Okay, so um, uh, now, how much time do we have left? Oh, we're nearly finished. <laughs> so I haven't timed this very well because we have five minutes left. Um, so I guess it's time for closing statements, if anybody has one, or anybody from the audience who'd like to take the floor and tell us something about their perspective on this, or otherwise I guess we could... Uh... Nick, thank you. <laughs> um, actually, the question for Dorothy, uh, Specifically on, on a lot of these measurements, there's been quite a, a bit of conversation that's kind of crossed us to uh, human activities both on land or in the oceans with shipping routes or aquaculture, things like that. Um, do you, what the, what's the interplay you see in the data that you collect as to like uh, linking up those kind of human caused pressures or uh, the pressures caused by economic activity on the data that you collect? And is that something you could think about actually linking a little bit closer? rather than just presenting the data as it is, but also then linking it to causes of changes within the data? Or is that not something you see? Um, tell um, me if I need to rephrase that question, because I can see the somewhat perplexed look on your face. I'm not sure that that's an easy question to answer. So one of the things we try to do is try to collect these measurements with consistent quality for from one year to the next. So our current data products, uh, the data collection really started in earnest in the mid 90s. Um, so we can look at change over time as long and but so that's why we find it so important to keep this data collection consistent so we can compare now you could add process studies or specific studies to a specific area uh, that you want to study uh, human activities in uh, so you could add additional parameters uh, to study if you want to Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Mutia. I'm from Indonesia. Um, I study marine environmental resources right now in the Erasmus Mundus program in Belgium. Yeah, I really like um, this talk a lot because it resonates a lot with my uh, blue carbon research, actually. Um, I think um, it is important also to gather um, more multi-stakeholders like government, even the civil society, like for example, like us that doesn't know what oceans mean to us, how do we do, how can we do to contribute to the carbon storage or like how can I do to offset my carbon footprint? And I think that in the future, that would be business models that can gather the information how uh, the industries or like the people can um, calculate how much the carbon that, that I can offset that is taken uh, that been uh, calculated in the blue ca uh, in the blue carbon especially, and it is amazing to see the researchers here from Nordic um, uh, have del uh, have have developing the research. How do we calculate uh, the carbon content in our oceans? And um, it can go uh, even further, like for the bilateral corporations, for example, which if our indices, like for example, our Indonesia, we have like 41 percent uh, with the international effort, meaning that we are so open for uh, the multicultural, uh, the multilateral and bilateral cooperation in the future. And it can involve not only researchers, academicians, but also the governments and businesses. And it can go beyond, I believe it can so. And I think it should be um, introduced the co-benefits uh, to also the people, like for in our country, we are developing nations and we are still struggling a lot. How to educate um, our local communities? Why do we have to 
um, restore the mangrove instead of making the shrimp aquaculture, for instance. This is the source of the livelihoods of these people. So we need to think about the business model, how the restoration itself can actually bring the benefit to the local community in a way that it can improve the, the social welfare in this community as well. And yeah, this is for, like, for the people and for the planet and prosperity, of course. Thank you. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I think you've made some really important points there. Um, this is, at the end of the day, all about people and it's about the choices that they make. Um, and there are tensions between using the coastal zone for one thing versus another thing. Um, and you know, that just goes to the heart of it. So I sort of feel that in this session we've had a good discussion, but we haven't really reached any very, very concrete things. And perhaps that's indicative of where we are in our journey to, a, to this. We know that this is a good idea. We know that there are co-benefits. We know that there needs to be a business model that works. We know that there has to be a value chain. Um, but we're not quite at the point where we can kind of say, this is how it's going to work. And I think that's a considerable challenge for all of us, actually. Um, and if we go away from here and say, well, that was a great session, uh, let's, um, you know, we'll come back again in a year and have another great session, then um, we'll have lots of great sessions, but we won't have really kind of like progressed it. So I think we've got some work to do between us. I don't know what your perspective is. I wanted to speak up for, for education and, on, and, and science. Uh, you asked me a question earlier. I think uh, I think you, I grew up with uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers uh, uh, sponsoring a lot of um, research schools, uh, joint research schools from all the Nordic countries. Uh, this has more or less gone away. Uh, this is something I would like to see come back. And I would like to see business, I would like to see policymakers being part of these research schools as well. Uh, without getting that integ integration into, into educating a new generation of researchers uh, that are going to also go out and work in society, uh, I think we have an even longer way to go. So you see the Nordic Council of Ministers being a real force for good if they get it right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. They have a lot of good examples on that. Are we done? Thank you very much.